talking about preparing your wine for bottling, the idea here is really to talk about how can we uh, preserve and um, maintain the quality of the wine you work so hard to make uh, over time uh, during bottling and then after uh, in the bottle. So there is two uh, things here. So the first thing is that it's at this moment that it is the last time you can adjust uh, the balance of the wine profile. So you can actually fine tune and tweak uh, your wine profile. Uh, this can happen with finishing tannins, with finishing monoprotein, Arabic gum. Um, just make sure you work with fully soluble and filtrable options and products. Um, we um, at La Motabier can offer them. Uh, we are happy to send you a trial kit where you can try all our finishing products uh, to set up bench trial, but we can also uh, set them up for you. So we are happy uh, if you want to send us a 750 milliliter bottle of wine that you feel you want to see what we can do or you want to work on it or, you know, whatever you uh, feel like, we are happy to work on uh, the wine and then send you sample of what we think works the best for your objective and um, and move from there. So that's the first thing you can do before bottling and to prepare your wine to bottling. Make sure you are 100% uh, happy with the wine profile. The second thing is to prevent the wine instabilities. For this, we are going to have to anticipate the wine, the storage conditions. So this can um, a little bit depends of which type of glass you are using. Are you using uh, transparent glass? Are you using green glass? Are you using dark green? Um, which type of uh, closure you are going to use? Are you controlling how much oxygen are going through or not? And um, how long are you going to age this wine? Do you keep it uh, in your tasting room and you have completely control, complete control on the storage? Or are you selling it to a supermarket where you don't control necessarily the storage and the wine is on the light on the shelf? Okay, so all this will impact um, the stabilities of the wine. So depending um, your uh, sales channel, I would say, and the future of the wine bottle, you can uh, see which instability is more important for you. And the goal, of course, is always to respect the wine profile. So when we talk instability, we are talking about the microbial instability. So this can happen uh, if your wine is not um, fully stable when it goes to bottle. Uh, there is some risk of uh, microbial development in the bottle, which means change completely the wine profile and make um, you can have some wine that becomes sparkling. You can have some wine that uh, have off aromas, off color, highly turbid, etc. Then we are talking about oxidative stability. So this highly depends on the color of your glass, the um, closure you choose, and the condition of uh, aging. You can stabilize your wine towards oxidation to make sure that whatever happened to the bottle of wine, the wine is not going to move and your profile is going to be respected. So here we're going to talk a little bit about pinking, uh, a little bit about just change of color, and how to preserve and uh, stabilize the wine regarding oxidation. Then there is a protein instability. So this is for white and rosé usually, or in very light uh, tannins red. We uh, can have, we have some unstable uh, protein that then can create a haze if they encounter heat. So if uh, somebody buys the wine, the white wine in summer, leave it in the car, drive all day long to do some different tasting, then uh, you, you can end up with a bottle that is cloudy and hazy. We can have tartaric instability. So this is when you put the wine in the fridge or just over time, you will have tartaric uh, precipitation. Uh, people don't like this at all. They get very easily scared. Uh, they think there is a deposit, it's not safe, it's not healthy, and they don't want to drink it. And then we can talk about color instabilities. This can happen in red wine usually. Um, when you just age, leave the wine a little bit um, in the bottle, you can have a precipitation of color, um, so of coloring matter deposit, basically. 
that uh, then we know uh, from a market study that only 15% of American consumer would buy a bottle uh, that has deposit in it. So it's actually, you, you are missing um, quite a lot of consumer when you do have a deposit in the bottom. So all these stabilities are pretty um, important to talk about. So talking about the last chance to adjust your wine profile, this is something uh, that really just please contact us. We send you samples. You can send us samples and we work on the tasting. So it's more about um, trying the product in your wine and see what we can do. And we, we already have uh, webinars talking about this. So today I'm really focusing on all the different instabilities. Starting with the microbial stability. So when we are talking microbial stability, we already have a webinar that has been done on microbial stability that is complete and talk about the entire process. Uh, today, we really focus on the last step. So just before aging and bottling, just during aging and before bottling. But what can happen? Basically, you can have high VA, the wine transforming type of vinegars. You can have some um, animal characteristics that develop. This is if you have some bretanomyces of some bacteria. So the wet dog type of aromas, the horses stable, uh, but also gamey, boar, bear, you know, any gamey wild animal, uh, the smell attached to it can be found in wine. So, which sometimes can be wanted, but usually when you arrive pre-bottling, you don't want this to happen in your bottle uh, without you controlling it. You can have also aromas such as dirty mop, um, sweaty, dirty socks, uh, cheesy characters, uh, mousy character that's due to lactobacillus, um, where um, it's an aftertaste that is very not uh, pleasant. It tastes like uh, mouse urine or like any uh, little animal in a cage that, um, yeah, fur animal uh, urine. And it can also taste like algaes or like just um, stagnant water. So basically pretty bad. Uh, so you do want to avoid this. Um, especially if it happens uncontrolled and you think your wine is fine, you send it to the customer and the person that will taste all your labor and all your passion that you put in this bottle is going to end up with a wine that is completely spoiled. So that's very important to make sure it doesn't happen in an uncontrolled way. How can we do this? There is several tools that exist in winemaking. So you can we can talk about sulfur. You can use sulfur. And here we are mostly talking about molecular sulfur, so it depends of your free and your pH uh, to make sure you control it and you want to be around 0.6 of molecular sulfur. Um, I'm happy to help you calculating where is your molecular sulfur, there is tables with pH and free sulfur. Lysozyme is an option. Lysozyme is going to be added to the wine. Lysozyme is allergenic and uh, it comes from egg white. It's a protein coming from egg white, an enzyme coming from egg white. It is um, necessary to use bentonite when you use it in white and rosé, and it will remove some color when you use it in red. But it's very efficient in removing bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, so anococcus, pediococcus, lactobacillus. Then you have ketosan. Ketosan is a polysaccharide that is actually a vegan, allergen-free, and biodegradable. A wide spectrum antimicrobial agent. So it is gonna remove Brettanomyces, Lactobacillus, Pediococcus, Onococcus, but also Acetobacter and some non-saccharomyces. It, uh, it is a fining agent, so it doesn't stay in the wine. So you can treat your wine just before bottling, and then uh, you just uh, rack it off the lees. The most common way when we're talking pre-bottling is filtration. Make sure you are using fil sterile filtration uh, when we're talking about uh, microbial stability. DMDC with, or Velcorin uh, is mostly here to treat um, yeast, so Saccharomyces, so this is, and Brettanomyces. This is if you are, uh, well, you don't want Brettanomyces developing, or it can happen in a sweet wine that you want to make sure uh, saccharomyces will not do a second fermentation. And sorbate is also for uh, saccharomyces in a sweet wine. You just want to make sure there is no bacteria there because bacteria can metabolize 
sorbates uh, producing the geranium taint, which is not pleasant, very floral, uh, pungent type of aromas. Okay, so I want to focus a little bit more on ketosan, that is really the um, wider spectrum uh, antimicrobial agent that will not impact uh, the wine characteristic. We're talking about respecting the wine profile here, and also will um, is allergen-free, uh, biodegradable. So ketosan uh, at Lamatabi, our pure ketosan is called Kilbrett. Uh, even though it doesn't kill only Brettanomyces, it also kills uh, bacteria, so um, lactic acid bacteria, acetic acid bacteria, and some non-saccharomyces. It is a polysaccharide. It's derived from Aspergillus niger, so vegan, allergen-free, biodegradable, wide-spectrum antimicrobial agent, and it's very efficient at low dosage. So how ketosan works in general, it's really about uh, you will have the ketosan that is going to be attracted um, to the cells, uh, the microbial cell uh, walls by charge. Ketosan is positive and most of the cells are actually negatively charged or have negative uh, residue uh, on their, um, around their cells. So they get attracted to each other and then the ketosan at this point is going to start um, covering the cell. By covering the cell, you completely stop any interaction uh, with um, outside inside. So basically the cell can't communicate, can't feed, can't process, can't metabolize anything. So there is no metabolize. Then the ketosan is gonna actually go a little bit um, further um, in advance and it's gonna start to perform the membrane uh, of the cells and uh, resulting in a leakage of these cells. So the cell is gonna leak from inside and it's gonna be dead. You can see it here from uh, the pictures. We have a wine here that is not treated, that Brettanomyces cells are here. One day after the ketosan addition, you can see that already when we zoom on the cell, the cell is actually not functioning very well. Uh, there is some holes here, like there is no more function basically. Four days after the cell is starting to leak, all these dots around are actually pieces of cells or inside the cells. Eight days after, there is no more cells. So basically, you will add the ketosan, mix it in your wine, make sure it's actually well mixed when you integrate it, and then it's going to do its job with the cells and also settle. So you can kill Brettanomyces, acetic acid bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, and other non-saccharomyces, and settle them, and so you are ready to rack or to go to filter. We usually uh, talk about a prevention, so that means we are in a wine that we know there is no microbes, but we want to make sure there is no microbes, and we are talking two to four grams per hectoliters of Kilbrett. Uh, this is not the dosage for every ketosan on the market, that's really specific to the Kilbrett, and this will give you protection for about four months, that's when you are aging. Of course, when you go in the bottle, it gives you, pro there is nothing else that happen because you don't have any other source of contamination. If you know you have some microbes, we will recommend to do six to eight grams per hectoliters, followed by a racking. And then we would recommend you to check, um, to do an analysis, uh, to make sure you don't have uh, microbes present in your wine uh, that could potentially develop later on. Okay, so the second instability we're talking about is oxidative stability. So here as well, we do have a webinar that is way more complete than what I'm going to tell you today. But basically, uh, today I want to really focus on the last step in the preparation for bottling. Uh, what can happen if we are not stable uh, in an oxidative uh, way? Uh, well, uh, very quickly, your wine during bottling or post bottling uh, can uh, change color, can be completely uh, getting uh, brown like this, but also on red wine, now we can get completely brown. Um, we can have pinking, that's usually with a big shot of oxygen, dissolved oxygen, uh, and then the, the transparent glass and the light can produce pinking, so your white wine become pink like this, we are not talking about a rosé, it's usually associated with uh, some reduction type of aromas, but we can also have oxidized aromas uh, such as nuts, honey, dry flower, dry fruit, bruised apple, 
uh, all these aromas that are not necessarily what you wanted in your wine. Uh, so the idea here is to make sure that the wine you put in the bottle will stay as it is when you put it in the bottle. So when you sell your wine, people are tasting the wine you put in bottle and not complete different wine. Okay, so there is an impact on color, but also an impact of aromas. Of course, texture, mouthfeel is impacted too. So how can we uh, avoid uh, this? Obviously, um, to avoid it, so we, we need to reach stability regarding uh, the oxidative stability. So we want to make sure our wine will be resistant to any change. We'll have um, a buffered um, redox potential or a stable redox potential that is not at risk to go reduced or oxidize any little change that happened. Then, of course, we want to reduce the chances. So we want to limit any dissolved oxygen when you do a movement, a pumping, a transfer, a racking, but also when you go to bottle, make sure you use inert gas, so nitrogen or argon at this step. Um, CO2 is not recommended because you do usually adjust your CO2 before going to bottle uh, to make sure you are at the level you want. Um, and yeah, pretty much that, that's pretty much it. So avoid any dissolved oxygen. Then uh, we can work with a fining. So that's going to be more for whites and uh, rosé, where uh, fining is actually a great tool to achieve oxidative stability because we are removing precursors of oxidation. We are eliminating oxidized compounds. And it's also a tool that we can correct color if needed. So. Here, uh, I'm showing you some results uh, of trials where we did fine during fermentation and we're looking at the wine during aging. Uh, but the fining can happen actually anytime in juice, in fermentation, or in aging. So here we are looking at the aromas. So the first graph that you see is looking at the esters, and the second is looking at the thiolic compounds. And basically, the control that didn't get fine versus polymix nature, that is a fining agent are completely different in terms of profile. By removing the precursors of oxidation early in the process, we actually avoid any uh, oxidation or prevent this oxidation, which allowed us to have a wine that is way more aromatic and way more stable in time. As you can see, we have way more esters and we also have way more uh, tiles with uh, time in the wine that we find. If we look at the color too, uh, you can see here a pretty nice palette of color in a rosé trial. And we have the control here. And then we have the wine that has been fine with different fining agents. Which fining agent is interesting for this purpose, for the oxidative stability? We are talking about protein-based or PVPP-based uh, fining agents. So here I give you three examples that are vegan allergen free. Finding agents, you have the polymix nature, which is the one you see in this trial, but also in the color, uh, you see it here. It's actually pretty much in the middle. PVPP, yeast derivate, and bantonite. This finding agent is also great to prevent pinking, uh, as uh, any PVPP based finding agent will help to remove the precursor the, to remove the precursors of pinking and the phenolic compound that can uh, induce pinking. Green fine mast, it's a pure pea protein. You can see we are actually a little bit more red here. Green fine mast is really focusing on removing the yellow and the precursors of oxidation. Uh, so it's going to stabilize very well your wine through time, not touching much the color compared to the control. And the green fine express that you see here, this one is a little bit stronger. So we will remove its pea protein with PVPP, ketin glucan, and bantonite. It will remove some red and some yellow. This uh, wines uh, that you see here on the picture has been treated during aging. And then we bottle them. And here you are looking at the picture of an aging, aged bottle. OK, so we aged this bottle on the light for a few months before taking the results. So finding is a pretty big step in terms of reaching oxidative stability. The other step we can do is improving the resistance of oxidation, working on the redox potential of the wine with um, tools such as glutathione or uh, tannins. So today I'm going to focus more on the glutathione 
We do have a webinar that talk only about shelf life, focusing on oxidation, where we talk also about tannins, but usually untoasted oak tannins are the best tannins you can use for uh, buffering redox potential and making sure you are less sensitive, your wine is less sensitive to oxidation or reduction. So using um, glutathione, glutathione is a pretty strong uh, antioxidant. It's actually stronger than sulfur. So this will allow you to uh, protect your aromas, protect uh, your wine, prevent any change in color or any degradation of aromas through time during a uh, bottling. And also, you know, if you do pick up some dissolved oxygen, it's going to help you acting as the first antioxidant, maintaining your uh, free sulfur proper. Okay, so you will have to you have you will have less adjustment of free sulfur to do. How to add glutathione in your wine? You will need to add yeast derivatives that are rich in glutathione. At La Motagie, we developed Aroma Protect, which is like basically more than half of its composition is uh, glutathione. So it's a very um, concentrated product in glutathione. We use 10 to 30 grams per hectoliters, and we really saw pretty much no impact on the uh, wine profile, no impact on the quality of the wine. It doesn't change anything except that your wine becomes more stable through time. Uh, we elongate the shelf life of the wine. Uh, that's for whites, rosé, sparkling, and uh, red. As you can see here, so this is actually three different wine where uh, which they are Sauvignon Blanc. We are looking at the tiles. They are usually easy oxidable compounds. So that's why we're looking at them. Uh, but you basically can see that uh, on the control in each wine, we lost a lot of aromas from 75% to 60% of the full thiolic pool. We lost it in six months of aging, while with the Aroma Protect, we lost between 30 to 25% of the aromas. So we really managed to um, protect the wine, prevent the loss of aromas, respect and maintain the wine quality over time. That's a very good tool um, to add pre-bottling. So pre-bottling, we would talk about 10 grams per hectoliters, and you will, you can reduce your sulfur addition, but you also can improve your shelf life at the bottom. So now talking about uh, more uh, stabilization. So that will not necessarily impact your wine profile, but more the visual aspect of the wine and stabilization that people, uh, consumer, a wine consumer, uh, wants to have. Protein stability is an important one uh, because you can take the risk to basically have a cloudy, hazy wine, as you see in the picture. Um, this is really anticipating the storage conditions. So this is thinking that the wine or will be um, stored for a long time or will be stored in high temperature. So we're trying to anticipate what can happen. And if the wine gets cloudy, usually people don't like it. It doesn't change anything about the taste. But how to stabilize for protein? Unfortunately, there is not many options here um, other than what you know already, which is bentonite. So one important thing is how to choose bentonite for protein removal. Make sure you focus on sodium bentonite or calcium sodium activated bentonite. Um, the pure calcium bentonite are here to settle and to compact lease, but they are not very efficient in protein removal. So you will need way more uh, dosage and you will impact more the wine profile. So sodium or calcium sodium activated bentonite for protein removal. What we have as an option, we have the bentosol poudre that is our sodium bentonite, very efficient in protein removal. You can actually work at pretty low dosage um, and have a very good result, pretty compact, but also having um, very little impact on the wine aromas. So the idea here is to not strip the wine too much with bentonite. And so don't use too much bentonite and uh, a clean, pure bentonite. As you can see, we focus really on purity. So you can see the picture here of the bentonite. It's a very clean uh, white powder uh, that is um, really pure. So no residues that will go in the wine. The second bentonite we offer 
is called bantosol FT. And this, bantos, this bantonite is actually specifically um, designed to go through cross flow. So you can do an injection online of a cross flow, or you can add it in your tank, keep it in suspension, and go through, through cross flow. You will not damage the cross flow. We are actually working on a purification and removing all the abrasive part of the bantonite to make sure you can use it in cross flow. And um, working for a company that here uh, we sell a booker equipment so we can actually, uh, we are directly impacted with cross flow filtration and bantonite, we use them pretty commonly together. And I can tell you that there is no risk or damage of the cross flow. The advantage of this is that in one passage, you basically um, can do everything. You can filter and stabilize for, for protein. This will allow you to save volume because you don't have to rack, but also to save quality because you don't have to rack, so you don't have to take the risk to dissolve oxygen. The efficiency of the bantonites, usually they are better at lower pH. They are working better at higher temperature and they are working better at lower alcohol content. So this says we usually recommend to use bantonite early in the process, maybe during fermentation, at least a part of the bantonite you would need, uh, just to reduce your needs later down the road and limit the impact you have on the final wine profile. To test, it's a heat test. So work with your lab, or if you do it in-house, that's great. Just make sure you work on your final blend and you make the test with the bantonite you're going to use. So if you work with a lab, just request the lab to use the bantonite you uh, would like to do, to use. OK, so this said, so I told you there is not many options um, other than bantonite to stabilize protein, but there is. So bantonite is really the last thing you can do to achieve protein stability. But during fermentation, there is some steps you can do or during aging that will help you uh, getting closer to protein stability and maybe use less bantonite. The first one is to use tannins. So gallic tannins are very efficient for this. They have a very strong affinity with proteins. And so they will bind to them and remove them. That's usually the problem we have in red wine, while um, proteins makes uh, us lose our phenolic compounds. So protein will bind with tannins, and we want to keep tannins. In uh, white and rosé, it's the other approach, where actually we add tannin to remove protein. OK, so we can use uh, something. The product is called tannin gallic al alcohol. It's a pure gallic tannin that we develop for white and rosé, because you can see the color here we work on having a very lightly colored tannin that will not impact the color of your wine. Five to 10 grams per hectoliters on grape juice or during fermentation. And as you can see here, a little graph, you have, uh, we did um, the protein, uh, the heat test here on a wine. So the Delta NTU uh, should be lower than two to be considered stable. Our control here, even with 80 grams per hectoliters, is still unstable. We still didn't reach stability. While when we added tannins, these are two different tannins, you can see that basically arriving at 60 grams per hectoliters, we reach stability. So we saved at least 20 grams per hectoliters of bentonite, which is a huge impact on the wine profile. Uh, this is one example with a lot of bentonite required, but this happened. Um, all the time, you really always can reduce your bentonite needs using tannins. The other tool that we have is yeast derivates such as Nature Soft. Uh, it's a yeast derivate rich in manoprotein. This is really to mimic lees aging. You probably realize that when you age your wine on lees, well, uh, your wine requires less uh, bentonite and it's more protein stable than if you don't age it on lees. So this is exactly how um, the development of this product happened. Um, with this observation, we realized that using manoprotein will help uh, stabilizing protein. So when we use Nature Soft during fermentation or during aging, uh, we see that we can reduce the need of bentonite. Okay. 
Next stability to talk about is the tartaric stability. Tartaric stability or tartrate stability is when uh, your wine produce crystals, as you see in the picture, and precipitates. Again, this usually doesn't impact much the wine profile. It can change a little bit the pH and the TA of the wine, but people, consumer, don't like this. They see crystal in the glass, they are scared it's actually pieces of glass or it's something unhealthy and they don't want to buy the bottle. So there is uh, two big families of uh, methods here. There is a subtractive and the inhibitive methods. So let's talk about both. So a subtractive methods here, we are talking about the traditional cold rolled with seeding or electrodialysis or ion exchange resins where we are removing something from the wine. So we are removing whatever would precipitate uh, from the wine. It's, uh, there is some pros and cons of these methods. So in green, you can see the pros. In orange, you can see the cons. So with, with a subtractive method, you can really reach a treat very high level of instabilities and you can treat calcium tartrate instability. So it's actually a very efficient way to stabilize for tartrate or calcium tartrate, potassium tartrate or calcium tartrate. Then on the other side, you have to know that doing this method, well, you are changing fully the wine. You are removing something from the wine. So you are changing the pH and the TA of the wine. You are uh, losing quality because, well, you have to put it cold for a while and you are removing things. So your quality is going to change. Your wine is getting uh, leaner, thinner. You take a high risk of oxidation. You're working at very cold temperature with movement with fracking that's uh, usually uh, associated with high um, dissolved oxygen, which gives you high risk of oxidation. You lose volume. And the main thing is that it's associated with a higher cost, uh, higher impact, uh, environmental impact. When I talk about cost, I talk mostly about energy, but also the labor. It takes, you know, if we're talking cold hold and seeding, it takes few um, weeks actually to reach stability of cold, then you need to do the racking and you have to clean the tanks and the full process is associated with higher cost and higher impact um, in terms of environment. Then because of all this um, point, uh, companies such as La Matabier uh, work on developing new methods that are actually more um, efficient and practical for the winemaker with limited impact on the environment. And so that's how we talk about the inhibitive method. Here, instead of removing whatever will precipitate, we just coat the particles to make sure they don't go together and they don't make a precipitation. So we make sure the wine will, these uh, compounds will not meet and will not create crystals. So we can use manoprotein, we can use Arabic gum, we can use CMC or the latest addition to this inhibitive method is KPA, potassium polyaspartate. In general, all these methods are associated with a lower cost. You preserve wine quality because you do one addition. It's really, you don't remove anything from the wine and these additions are neutral in terms of taste. Uh, you don't lose volume, you actually increase your volume. You have zero to very low environmental impact. You don't have to rack, you don't have to use energy, you don't have to clean your tank. So in terms of water saving, it's pretty important, but also uh, electricity. It's a very fast and practical process. The only cons I would say in this is that it's not for every single wine. So you do need to do some testing and understand if your wine is a good candidate or not. Just to give you an idea, this is a study from 2012. So it's not really up to date, but still the ratio can be pretty um, similar. Uh, it's probably the gap is probably bigger now. And we are talking euro per hectoliters. So I know it's not highly fully related to US, but I think it's still a very good source uh, to understand here where um, a cold treatment and a cold treatment with seeding are actually very high cost. So we are talking about 3.74 euro per hectoliters here in this study. 
um, with cold treatment with seeding, while if we compare to an inhibitive method such as CMC, we are talking about less than one euro per hectolitre. So it's a, it's a very different cost by treatment, um, which makes it very important and very interesting. So I want to focus a little bit on CMC and manoprotein. So when we talk about CMC, CMC is carboxyl methyl cellulose, and uh, that's uh, the name of the molecule. It is a molecule that, um, it's a product that is usually associated with very low cost. So, um, very easy to use, a quick addition. It's a liquid uh, format that you just add in your wine and you mix it. So energy and water saving, there is no impact on the wine. You don't change aromas, you don't change pH, you don't change TA, you really maintain and preserve the wine qualities. The cons of the CMC is that it interacts with protein. So you need to be protein stable and it can interact with color. So we don't recommend it to use it on red wines. Okay, if it does react with protein, uh, it, it produces this type of haze and flaky uh, white um, stuff in the wine that look like this picture that you can see in your screen. So there is some wine requirement to use CMC only on white and light roses that are protein stable and filtrable. Then. How to use it? What is CMC? So CMC at La Motabie is our Vino Protect. Uh, it's a liquid solution, 5% solution CMC with a high efficiency and low viscosity. So very easy to use uh, and very efficient. Convenient, uh, it's very quick. You add it two days after you can filter bottle. You respect um, the wine profile. The wine profile doesn't change actually. Uh, it's pH independent and there is no impact on filtrability. So pretty much you really add the wine, this to the wine and your wine is stable. Application 100 to 200 mils per hectoliter. So we recommend to do a conductivity test before. So we understand how uh, stable is the wine. So we can help you choosing which dosage uh, would fit the most your, uh, your wine. And you can test again to see if the dosage is correct. But with the initial instability, we can help you already. For steel wine, 24 to 72 hours before the final filtration bottling. For sparkling wine, we add this at tirage. Okay. In terms of manoprotein, so there is a lot of pros uh, for manoprotein. It can stabilize color and tartrate. It will improve mouthfeel. So it gives you a little bit of roundness and volume, not much because the manoprotein we develop for. Um, tartrate stability are not the same manoprotein that we use for mouthfeel. So it's a very limited impact, but it still helps. Very natural approach. These are coming from yeast. Uh, they are present in the wine already. Very quick and easy to use. Energy and water saving maintains the wine quality. There is no interaction with protein, so you, and no interaction with color, or it stabilizes color. So you can use it on red, on rosé, on white, on sparkling, and you don't need particularly to be protein stable. You need for the protein stability, but not to use the bantonite, the yeast manoprotein. The cons, well, it is more costly than the CMC. Still better than a cold treatment though, but within the um, inhibitive uh, approach, inhibitors of crystallization, it is in the most expensive product. But again, uh, it's less, expensive and um, traditional methods. So the only requirement would be to have the wine filtrable and that's if you want to filter your wine later down the road. Um, Stab K is the La Motabie uh, winemaking product. So it is a manoprotein that is rich in MP40. That's the uh, manoprotein we selected and we know has a good impact on uh, tartaric and color stability. Convenient, easy to use. It's working on color and tartrate, pH independent, and no impact on filtrability. As you can see here, uh, the trial, we have a control that show crystal after a crystallization test. So that's just a cold hold in the fridge. Uh, we already cr created crystal in the control, while with manoprotein, we didn't. And the filtrability index didn't change or got better 
uh, from step K. The lower the filtrability index is, the better it is. Application, same thing, you need to test before, so we understand just a conductivity test or a crystallization test will make us understand how unstable you are, and then we can help you with the dosage. For steel wine, 24 to 72 hours before final filtration for sparkling wine at tirage. I told you step K also impact the color, so it will help color stabilization. That's the last stabilization I, I wanted to talk about with you because it's very important when um, on a red wine, we bottle it and if the color is not stable, usually it is linked to tartrate. Uh, but if the color is not stable, you will have precipitation in the bottle. There is many things you can do during the process to help stabilizing the wine. Towards the end, usually a fining is recommended to remove whatever is not stable. But if you don't want to go through a fining, you can also use STAP K. STAP K, uh, so it's a yeast monoprotein we just talked about, will help you with both. So as you can see here, there is two different trials. Uh, we are looking at the presence of crystals and we are looking at the NTU for a cold rolled. Lower than 20, uh, change of NTU after a cold rolled of 48 hours will tell us if the wine is stable or not. So lower than 20, we are stable. You can see here the control is 65. The one with step K is 10. Filtrability index improved with step K. But also, if you look at the filter after the filtering the wine, we have no um, deposit of color material and no tartrate. Same here, we did two different dosage to understand which dosage would work the best. And you can see that actually with the lower dosage, we are already fine. So it's interesting to try different dosage to really use what is adapted to your wine. I'm very happy to send you the protocol on how to do the cold hold and the crystallization test. So you can send you samples also of the CMC or the step K for you to try in your wine and to see that it doesn't change the taste of the wine and it will help stabilizing or reaching stability. So to conclude um, on the stabilization process and to get ready for bottle, of course, it's a full work of, during the entire winemaking process. But when we are ready for bottling, uh, the first thing to do is to make sure you want to adjust your wine profile. So you work on your blend, then you uh, send us a sample or you ask us for bench trial samples to finalize your wine profile. Once you have this, you want to make sure you're microbial stable and oxidative stable. Okay, so on white and rosé, blending, wine profile adjustment, oxidative stability, microbial stability. Once they are rich, you do your protein stability test. Okay, once your, pro your heat test tells you you are stable, you can go and test Vinoprotect or Stab K on your wine. So you can do conductivity. You can also do a crystallization test, which is six days at minus four Celsius. And you will see which dosage and which product works for your wine. They say you add it, you filter, you bottle. If your wine is not protein stable, you will need to add bentonite to stabilize it and test again. And then you can do your cold stabilization. OK? Then when we talk about uh, dark roses or red, so same thing, we work on final blend after the wine is oxidative stability reached and microbial stability reached. We do the color stability test, which is a cold hold for 48 hours. The NTU, uh, the turbidity change should be lower than 20. If it's not, we usually recommend a, fi a slight fining with Naturfin Prestige. But actually, sometimes a stab K is enough. If you are below 20, you do your test with stab K, crystallization test or conductivity test. And this will give you uh, which dosage and uh, of the product you can use. It's more rare to test for uh, tartaric stabilization in red just because we usually age the wine longer with lees in barrels. So you have a lot of interaction with manoprotein already that happened that naturally stabilize the wine. But um, 
seeing uh, now the market we are bottling sooner and sooner putting wine that are actually red wine uh, on the market that are younger uh, which usually um, require a little bit of help to be fully stable so that's why i also talk about red so thank you very much for your attention uh, i hope